I come from a different platform than most of the speakers today, or most of the speakers you hear, would hear anywhere uh, do. Uh, I am not of that tribe. I came from a background of being a military officer. My father was a third generation career army officer. And the only reason that's significant is that just because I came from a different perspective, a different place of observation in our world, if you will. And as I moved through that path, I thought I was on purpose in what I was doing. And I did really well in that service. I commanded the Army's only separate airborne rifle company, the US Army's only separate airborne rifle company. And I commanded that company as a young lieutenant, barely outranking those that were under my charge. And I went on from there to be a commander of uh, 240 airborne rangers for the US Army, and from there left and went to another assignment and another assignment. It was while I was in the desert in this photograph that you see here in the deserts of Jordan that I was actually wounded uh, a second time. My first wound was a wound in the lower abdomen, and my second wound uh, came in the, to the head. And no, it did not split my head open, but uh, what did happen is a 7.62 millimeter Jordanian machine gun round traveling roughly 2,832 feet per second, so you don't get to see it coming and you can't duck, struck me right smack dab in the head and lodged in my helmet and knocked me unconscious. And so all of these things were kind of like the universe trying to say to me, you have got another path you're supposed to be on. And the path you're on is not that path you're supposed to be on. You have to reassess what your calling in this life is and what you have elected to follow. You need to look at whether or not you're truly defining your personal mythology with the great gifts that you have been given. And if you can answer yes to all of those things, then find your life on purpose. So my life was not on purpose, despite the fact that I was a hero in my own mind about what it was that I was doing. And I was living in support of this thing called the great lie. And the great lie that is, is that everything we do, we do in the interest of the national security of our nation. And so therefore, any means is justified by the illusion or the imaginary end. And I believed that. And I lived my life in support of that. So I made a decision to resign at my commission at 18 years of service in 1995. And I went on to write several books. The books I write uh, are nonfiction. Uh, the, book, the first book that I wrote was a book entitled Non-Lethal Weapons, War Without Death, which is considered a textbook in the US military because it's a, it's a book that decides or des looks at why we design weapons and forces to meet our national security interests and needs. So in that respect, it's not a book that you would normally pick up for easy reading on the train somewhere, but it is a good book to pick up if you want to go to sleep. So <clears throat> it works. Can't get through chapter two myself without falling asleep, and I wrote the thing. But it's a, it's a book that provides for you the vision of what it means uh, to consider alternative methods of conflict resolution on a global scale. And it addresses technologies that can be applied into those templates of current world events that allow you to, to consider that. So if you're interested in those kinds of things, it's a really wonderful book to read. If you're not interested in that, it's not something you would want to go pursue. My second book was a book entitled Psychic Warrior Inside the CIA Stargate Program, The True Story of a Soldier's Espionage and Awakening. That was a hard one to say. Now, it wasn't necessarily my title, and I want you to know very clearly that I make no pretense of being psychic, and I make no pretense of being clairvoyant. I make no pretense of being highly intuitive. I make no pretense of be, being an enlightened human being. I will only tell you that because of what I know, I consider myself to be an empowered human being because I understand how to stand in both worlds and to take from the non-physical as well as the physical, from the unconscious as well as the conscious. And this I know it's not something I believe. So I'll share bits and pieces of that with you today and talk to you about how that might make a difference in your life and in your business and your relationships and everything that there is that is around you because you really have to get the fact that you need to have something that allows you to see outside of what it is that's just around you. If all you are going to rely upon in your life is what you can see and touch and feel around you, then you will always live a life of limits. You will always live a life where someone else is defining your promise and your possibility. You have to step outside of the opinion and the interpretation and the judgment and the decisions of other people. And when you can learn to do that, because it is an inherent ability within each one of you, it's not unique to me. You don't have to get dinged in the head by a machine gun bullet. You don't have to have some other spiritual, emotional, or physical trauma in your life to make that happen. You have only but to be in a place that says, I wish, I hope, I desire to know, I believe that there is something more than the physical. 
There just simply has to be something other than just this. And if you can be in that place, if you can be in that place, then you have all that's required for you to make the journey inward and outward to come to this new place of discovery for yourself. These are some things that we see ourselves facing in this life. Everyone just seems to be facing a crisis of confidence. Every one of us in this room have faced a crisis of confidence on one time or another, and you may be there now. That might be why you're here. Recovery, be it economic, be it political, or even spiritual, it never seems to arrive for us. Uncertainty exists in virtually every aspect of our lives, our organized religion, global terrorism, regional trade agreements, viruses plaguing our cities, real or contrived, right? Corporate corruption, political corruption, warfare on an ever-increasing scale of lethality, and global projection. Our lives, as well as our collective, individually and collective, seem to be somewhat Sisyphusian. Now you know about the myth of Sisyphus, right? The guy that pushed, condemned to push the rock up the hill and then let it roll back down again, up the hill and back down again, kind of seems where we are at times. We're experiencing a general fear that we're going to fail if things don't get better. Next, we can't find solace in leadership and expert rhetoric. Why? It just doesn't answer it for us. It doesn't, we're relying upon the interpretation and the opinion of others. At last count, there were 4,876 different self-help books out in the bookstore. Some still in publish and some not. 4,876. Think about that. And yet still, we find ourselves coming together in small and large enclaves asking questions. So you're asking yourself these kinds of questions. How am I supposed to make my life, make a difference in my life when all around me is this tumultuous world condition that is spinning out of control? How and where do I find the courage to step out of my life? You're not going to find it from the words of other people. Not very often. Oh, you can read words that inspire. You may go to a lecture that inspires like this one. But it's still, where are you going to find it? Where are you really going to find it? Because if you, if you just listen to what is said up on this stage, if that's all that happens, then you're still in a belief structure. Do you understand that? You're just listening and, and listening and developing your own interpretation in the moment about what is being said up here. And you're going to step out of here and walk back there tonight, and it doesn't matter what you do, where you are is simply in this place. I believe what he said. Or I choose to accept his interpretation of what I already knew, so it sort of validates what I believe about what he said, right? So where do you find this courage? It has to come from some place other than the guy standing on the stage. And I'll tell you where it comes from. It comes from inside. It comes from inside. And you must be willing to have the courage to do that and explore that. And we'll talk about how you do that. So how do you transcend conditioning to see through the event horizon? Those are the things that you need to look at. How do I become all that is possible for me? Well. Here are some really simple things. This is my friend Wayne Dyer and Deepak Chopra. Incidentally, Deepak and I now, we teach this together. We're teaching remote viewing. That's a bizarre thing. Here I am up talk, talking about this central intelligence agency, in, you know, intelligence collection methodology called remote viewing, which Joanne sort of gave you the response to that. Remote viewing, which is not what I'm going to talk about today, but remote viewing is the learned ability to transcend space and time to view persons, places, or things remote in space and time and to gather and report intelligence information on the same. That's what the Department of Defense calls it. What it really is is the learned ability to apply two kinesthetic activities to detect and decode four-dimensional waveform data, to decode that four-dimensional waveform data into coherent three-dimensional thought form and to further objectify the coherent three-dimensional thought form into two-dimensional media, making sketches and recording verbal sensory data in the form of colors, textures, temperatures, tastes, dimensions, sounds, energetics, textures, emotionals, aesthetics, and so forth and so on. He likes that. Okay? So, we're not really going to talk about that. What we're going to talk about is other things that empower you. So here are some really simple things, like, again, Wayne Dyer will tell you. If you really want to know what will bring possibility and promise into your life, you do these kinds of things. Stop worrying, right? Just stop worrying. Stop judging others. Stop being angry and have no rage. 
Now, the stop worrying thing, we'll talk about that as we get through this thing. It'll kind of be an implied instruction in that. But this thing of stop judging others. When we talk about stopping to ju stop judging others, here's what we're talking about. Do nothing, say nothing, be nothing, act upon nothing that harms another individual physically, emotionally, or spiritually. So don't say to me, ah, well, how can I stop judging? I have to decide to have French's mustard or Morehouse mustard on that hot dog, right? You have Morehouse mustard up here? Damn near a third world country, that's all I can say, you know? Damn near. Morehouse mustard, it's in the family. I, I think, I wish, because it's a lot of mustard down, down at South. So, harm no one physically, emotionally, or spiritually. Say nothing, do nothing, be nothing, think nothing in that respect. Is that a discipline? Absolutely it's a discipline. Does it work all of the time? No, it doesn't work all of the time. All of us are human, so what does that mean? You must, in the moment, choose, and I'll talk more about that in a bit. You must, in the moment, choose to have no judgment. You must choose to have no judgment. And when you find yourself failing in that respect and having judgment, have no judgment of yourself and step into the moment again and then choose again to have no judgment. Stop being angry and have no rage. You must be capable of turning rage, this fury, this energy of rage, and turning it into a fierce compassion. And when you can do that through the practice of exploring and understanding and knowing and stopping believing, then what you will be capable of doing with that rage now turned into this fierce compassion is to begin to, in the moment, control your life, deliver your life, your life situation and your life with a love and a compassion and an energy that is present present in love and compassion. Because if you have anger and rage, all you are doing is fueling, ladies and gentlemen, the dominant frequency which exists around this planet right now, which is fear and hatred and anger. Those are dominant categorical imperatives driving everything that happens in our reality. Only, you only have but to turn on CNN or some other news station and watch it for an hour. Anybody feel really motivated to go do good things after watching an hour of CNN? Huh? I didn't think so. Okay? There we go. Stop letting others define your reality and limit your possibility and your promise. Here's a real simple trick for that. You stand up and on the remote there's a red button and you push the button and it turns the power off on the television because when you stop listening to it and when you stop watching it, everything there is not designed to motivate you, to inspire you, to build a life of promise or to give you a, a life of promise, a, a possibility. Everything that's being fed to you and the frequency of the message and the amplitude of the message or the strength of the message is being designed to limit you to limit your possibility, to limit your promise, to limit what you see around you and how you see the world. It's back to that whole thing again of how can you be inspired to do something different when all around you is this tumultuous world of human fury that you see all around you. And you are constantly reminded of it. I'm always impressed there's a new radio station that's up in BC that all they do, it's called News for the Soul if you're not listening to it, and what they do is they have this positive news station. And what they do is you turn it on and all you get to hear is good news, right? But there's an old saying at CNN that if there were headlines in the newspaper, world peace breaks out, it wouldn't sell a lot of newspapers, you know? Stop being morally irresponsible in your communication. And simply what that means is take responsibility for what you say and who you say it to. And don't just throw things out in some condescending way. Don't throw things some out in some patronizing way. Be morally responsible for your communication. Be clear and complete in what you say and how you say it. To your spouse, to your colleagues and coworkers, to people you meet on the street or in a bus or in a train, be clear and complete in what you say. Stop putting someone else or something else between you and your challenges. Back in the CIA and in the Army, what they used to say is, oh yeah, he always puts somebody between him and the problem, okay? So change the language a little bit to mean challenges. You can't do that. If you're doing that, then you're not taking responsibility for who you are and what you are in your life situation. You're just always trying to find a reason why you haven't gotten to the place where you think you ought to be. So you can't keep doing that. 
can hear that all the way up here, can't you? Stop relying entirely on what you believe and focus more uh, on what you know. Stop relying entirely upon what you believe and focus more on what you know. And then you have to, of course, determine how it is that you know it. So let's talk about that a little bit. Stop relying entirely on what you believe. See, believing is easy, is easy and knowing is not. See, believing, when you really look at it, it's the kind of the pariah that's on the human condition of this particular planet. There have been more ki people killed because of what we believe or think we know than ever about what we know. At last count, in the United States, or just in North America alone, there are some 87 different versions of Christianity, right? Different versions of just that. You can take any other belief structure, whether it's organized religion or not, and I'm not just trying to imply that it's in a box of organized religion. It is constant. There are all kinds of belief structures that are out there that are limiting us. And while they do serve a purpose to some extent within the human condition, and I'll be first, the first to admit that to you, they do serve a purpose. You must be willing, again, to have the courage and the dignity to say, I understand what it presents to me, but I am willing to step outside of that and look beyond as well. So knowledge, then, is gained through what? Simply the experience of doing. Now, knowledge being more powerful and being that thing which comes from the experience of doing, you can say, then, that knowledge can only come from the physical three-dimensional reality in which I exist. Or perhaps it might come from some other place as well. When you take someone like an Einstein and other great thinkers of our time, in fact, all of the magnificent great thinkers of our time who have brought us to this position within the human condition, who have really propelled us technologically, uh, spiritually, uh, even emotionally, have propelled us to this particular point, and looking and focusing on the good things about this particular point in the human condition, those great thinkers have brought us to this place because they stopped believing in just what they were taught and could break out of a textbook. They looked through the event horizon and they gathered a knowledge of something that was out there that they then used everything else to catch up to that. We invented the math to get to where Einstein was seeing and knowing what he was experiencing. He wasn't just believing it in it any longer. He knew that it was possible to do and understand and see and gather together a whole new way of looking at science and physics in the world. And that is the same thing that you must be capable of doing. And it is. So knowledge fuels the most powerful force that we truly have, ultimately. And that force is simply choice. But choice where? Well, this is a real head scratcher. So if you look at this, this is really an embedded diagram that's really meant to be a four-dimensional model. And this diagram was made by Ernst Schettel and I. Uh, Schettel is the commandant of the Royal Norwegian Naval Academy and a theoretical mathematician. And we were defining the moment, because in the moment, which is the only reality that you have, you see that? It's really the only thing that you're in charge of. You're not in charge of the past, which is to the left of the red line. And you're not in charge of the future, which is to the right of the red line. You're only in charge of right now. Your moment is right now. No, right now. No, right now. No, right now. No, right now. OK? It's the only thing that's real. Everything else is conceptual illusion. Everything exists in wave form past that point. If you look at what uh, Deepak calls it, he calls it quanta, you know, well, which is a physics term for it, but quanta being that point at which there is uh, a property which exists between matter, bless you, between matter and energy, between matter and energy. And there it only becomes something particle or it only becomes matter when it, matter when it is observed. It becomes an incident in space-time at that particular juncture. But when it is not observed, it is not considered in that way, then it is, exists in a field of quanta. And if you look at that and consider that as the micro, then so is the micro, so is the macro. And as this is the macro, so is the micro when you're looking at it in that perspective. So when you're looking at this model again, the red line defining the moment, then the moment is defined at, if you look at the top equation, just the sum total of the two splits of the equation. On the top of the equation, it says that the moment is defined as energy equaling change approaching zero and time approaching zero. Now, change and time can never reach zero. They can only approach zero, right?
And the bottom part of the equation says that the moment is defined at the point at which energy equaling change approaching the infinite and time approaching the infinite. Again, change and time can never approach, or can never reach the infinite, they can only approach the infinite. So the sum total of the two or the two in taken independently of the other indicates the moment. So the moment then, if that's not something you're gonna remember and put, that, put down on a cocktail napkin for some conversation and going, eh, hey, I went to this seminar the other day and this guy told me what the moment was and here it is. And uh, this means the sum total of, and there, it, go through the whole thing. If you can't remember that, remember this. The moment is defined at the point at which the past meets the future, and the future meets the past. The past meets the future, and the future meets the past. It is the only reality you have. It's the only thing that you are in charge of is the moment. Everything else is conceptual illusion, and you have to remember that. So when we take it then and decide how do we choose, and how do you know what to choose, well, we've already been through this. You can rely upon the opinions of others. You can honor the objectives and the opinions of others. You can select from habits and patterns in your life situation. You can trust the interpretation of others. How many in here have done all this? I did. Put a uniform on for 18 years. The only thing that was really good about it, ultimately, is it taught me a lot, but I also didn't have to decide what to wear every morning. It's a tough decision now. Or you can make choices devoid of the opinions, interpretations, judgments, and beliefs of others. So how do we do that? Well, what is this thing that's gonna let us do that? Who uses it? How do they use it, or why do they use it, and how does it work? Well, it's a thing called next generation brainstorming, which is really taking this whole process of remote viewing and moving it into a new level. It was first developed when we were testing this uh, as part of a package that was being handed to the Office of Technology Assistance at the Congress of the United States, and this was being done back in 1988 and in 1989. And those of us that were part of this remote viewing program that worked for the CIA were brought into this particular organization to kind of develop this whole notion of thought incubation. And thought incubation simply is doing this. It is agreeing upon a question to be, ex to be explored. And then once that question is deci decided upon, then you are moved through some mechanism into an altered state of consciousness. Now don't be too alarmed by that. Sex is an altered state of consciousness. Anger is an altered state of consciousness. Hunger is an altered state of consciousness. Working out is an altered state of consciousness. So you have many varied multitude uh, and ideas and notions about what that is. In this particular case, you are driven into a theta wave state particularly an ultra deep theta wave state, meaning that we are trying to drive you to 3.5 to 5 hertz or cycles per second of brain wave activity. Now there are all kinds of mechanisms for making that happen. Some of them are just simply listening to uh, yogic relaxation, breath meditation kind of a tape will take you to that particular place. Some of you in here, how many of you in here are meditators? By hands, ah, very good. So those of you that have been through formal meditation training uh, will know how to get to that particular place as well. For uniformity's sake, what we do in this particular class is we give people a brainwave trainer where we can track then that they have gone to this altered state of consciousness, that in fact they are in this alpha descending from beta, which is where we are now, and then down into alpha, and then on through into the threshold of theta, which is what we want, where we want you to be. Some of you now, coming back after lunch, are well into alpha, uh, right on the threshold of theta. Uh, some of you are even approaching delta as I speak, right? <laughs> so who's using this when we get them to this particular place, and when you are in this particular place, in this altered state of consciousness? and you are then now looking outside the physical into this realm of ideas and notions and answers to questions and other kinds of things. You see, what's really critical about this is it can't be guided, do you understand? Because if it's guided, if somebody is taking you to this particular place and feeding possibilities to you, what's happening? You're again being driven to their interpretation and their possibility and their idea and their notion. So you have to then be capable of going to a place where you can stand outside of the judgment, the interpretation, the ideas, the notions of others, and you can harvest from this thing called in the lexicon of remote viewers, the matrix field. 
It can be, and it's not the Keanu Reeves matrix, okay? It's a matrix field, which with the matrix defined as the womb from which something exists. You could also call it the Akashic record. You could also call it the global mind. You could also call it the collective unconscious. You could also call it nirvana. You could call it the mind of God, if that's what makes you comfortable and how you try to see it. Not that you become God, but that you have access to all knowledge everywhere outside the physical. And see that thing that's welling up inside some of you right now where you're kind of going, what the hell is he talking about? That's your conditioning, you see? That's your conditioning. Someone's told you, don't think about those kinds of things. You see, we had a Swedish pediatrician who came to class one time. We were talking about this ability to see beyond the physical. And this Swedish pediatrician, as I was explaining this whole thing, likening your ability to see beyond the physical, developing non-physical eyes, this ability to detect and decode four-dimensional waveform data, back to that thing, right? That I said, well, you know, it went through the whole description of saying that it's like developing physical sight. And he went, it's not like that. He goes, With the, you come into this existence seeing perfectly. I go, what are you talking about, seeing perfectly? He did this hand and arm signal. He said, no, you come into this existence, you see perfectly. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, children born into this life, they see perfectly. They, they have an awareness of things that extend beyond. And then he used this as a medical doctor. He used this theological term, and he said, the veil is not yet closed behind them. So they see where they came from. They have this awareness of it. That's how they understand and know things without us, mom, dad, and everybody else in the room, trying to explain it to them. They know things. They feel things. They know how to react to certain things. How do you explain that? How can you explain the fact that a mother lactating, right, or a, who now hears a baby 3,000 miles away, the baby cries, simultaneously the mother begins lactating, right, producing milk, simultaneously. Now, Deepak calls that non-local, right, this non-local connection. He calls it this information passed through the gap. You can call it whatever you want to call it. It doesn't really matter at this point, except that you come to an understanding that there is a tremendous connection. Thank you, guys. You everybody look back there at the back. They put this giant sign up that says, 30, I'm into 30 minutes, OK? All right? So all of those kinds of things are available there. You have to now understand how you can harvest it. So who uses it? Lots of people. Sony, for example. Uh, when the United States government had a remote viewing program, the remote viewing program was there, and we were, what we were really trying to do is catch up to what the Soviet Union was capable of doing. We knew in 1972 that the Czechs, the Chinese, the Germans, the Israelis, the Soviets, and even the British all had this paranormal research programs that they were trying to use to find some edge uh, to allow them to gather information against the real or perceived enemies of their nation. Well, there were lots of things that spun out of those particular programs, but the Russian remote viewing program that came under the command of a man by the name of Ivan Sokolov was in existence for many years and was really kind of the premier program. When the Soviet Union collapsed, this particular program was offered up to the corporate world, and the people that took them were Sony. Now, what do they use remote viewers and other individuals to be capable of seeing? Well, what do you think? They're trying to look through the event horizon to see what future technologies lie on the outside of what we are capable of seeing in the realm of science, only in the realm of science, you see? And it goes into this whole idea and this whole notion of what science offers and what technology offers. You see, there's a distinct difference between science and technology. Technology does not evolve without science, but technology is the application of science yet unsolved. It's simple things like these lights that you see all up around you here. You know, there's not a physicist on the planet that can explain anything in, in anything other than theoretical terms how electricity travels down a wire, yet here we sit. And we're looking at light and light all around us. So we're not burning coal lanterns just because nobody could prove that for us, right? You know, we don't even know why a shower curtain sticks to your butt in the shower. We don't. Now, some of you may not be curious about that, but I always have been. <laughs> Looking down there going, you know, it's sticking. Why is it always sticking? And you try to get away from it, and it follows you right around in the shower. You turn one cheek, the other cheek, it just gets, it sticks. And you're thinking, what the heck? Well, there was some brave man one day who put 
26 computers together and modeled for 50,000 hours these 26 computers and came up with this whole idea about why shower curtains stick to your butt in the shower. And he published it in Scientific American. The very next month, when the next issue of Scientific American came out, there were six guys who anteed up and, and refuted his entire findings, right? They all had their six different theories about why it happened, and they were all willing to argue with him forever about why his theory would not work. So to this day, much to my chagrin, we do not know why a shower curtain sticks to your butt in the shower. But you also know, we don't even know really why aspirin works. We know that aspirin works in the body, but we really don't understand how it works. And if you go through the list of pharmaceuticals available to medical doctors that they give to you for various reasons, when you really look at the molecular chemistry of why they work in the body, in the physiology of the body, the vast majority of them, they do not know. They only know that when given, this is the outcome. So that is an application of technology that is born of science. But you cannot say that the application of technology that does not have an understanding, a full and complete understanding, does not warrant being applied in the human condition, because clearly it does. So science, then, must move through its deductive and inductive processes, always on this quest of trying to find the answer, right? And there are reasons, then, why science and spirit will never, ultimately, one replace the other, because science will not be able to always answer the unanswerable question, like, where do we come from, and what is God, and who are we, and where do we go when we leave here, and why am I here, and all of those kinds of things. Science isn't going to answer it. But that doesn't mean that science and spirit and science and technology cannot merge together into a new cusp flux working hand in hand to continue to hand off notions and ideas that will be applied within the human condition without ever ultimately finding some scientific resolution about where they come from and what they are. So what I'm doing up here for you as I get into it is going to show you some scientific explanations for things that are inherently non-scientific. Can we go back to that other slide? Just a little bit, thanks. So I talked to you about Sony. There are a great number of police officers in the, in the uh, demographic of uh, the, my company and what we teach. Out of 14,500 students that we have taught, I was reading today, it said 10,000 in the program, old information, 14,500 plus students that we have taught. The largest demographic on that are engineers of various disciplines, are engineers. The next largest demographic in that population are physicians of different, of varying disciplines. And the next largest demographic are law enforcement officers, and the next largest demographic are teachers. And the next largest demographic past that point moves into a multitude of humanity, which never really surfaces any large significant element of the population. So, Let's jump over the engineers and the physicians for a moment and let's talk about law enforcement officers. I had an individual that came to class some months ago. He was an undercover narcotics officer for a police department down in the United States in Rhode Island. He came to class and he said, we were taken down this house one day and there was this, it was a crack house, and as we got out of the vans to go bust the doors down on this house, we could see him bagging up the crack cocaine. So we knew it was gonna be a tough one. So we all drew our weapons and the guy goes up to knock the door down and as they knock the door down, they come running in and as he comes running in with his door, with his weapon drawn, a woman comes around the corner out of the kitchen where they were bagging up the rocks and she has a 12 gauge shotgun and she picks it up and points it straight at him. Now. As he's looking down the business end of this 12-gauge shotgun, everything in the moment slows down. And he reaches and attains this superposition, right? Supra-consciousness opening up into the superposition of possibility. And in the moment, he starts hearing this voice. And the voice says, don't shoot. And he starts having a conversation with the voice. What do you mean, don't shoot? That's a 12-gauge barrel, 12-gauge shotgun right there. That could kill me. Don't shoot. If you shoot, everybody's going to start shooting. But I'm supposed to shoot. Don't shoot. But I'm supposed to shoot. I'm trained to shoot. Don't shoot. So while all of that's happening, back into the physical world, right, his hand comes down onto the barrel of the 12-gauge shotgun, and he pulls it out of the arms of the woman, 
and throws it down on the sofa. And as they pull the woman down to arrest her, he looks on the back of her, right behind her, is her seven-year-old daughter sitting on a sofa playing with a bear. And he thinks to himself, if I had pulled the trigger with a nine millimeter, it probably would have penetrated her and maybe hit or wounded the young girl and killed her or wounded her sitting behind her. But that wasn't even the best part of this story. It wasn't the thing that motivated him to come to something to say, what was happening to me? How did I feel that? How did I know that? Where did it come from? Where was this voice? It certainly wasn't from the donuts I ate this morning or the burrito I ate for lunch. So what was it that was speaking to me? Because you know, the weapon was unloaded. The 12 gauge shotgun didn't have a round in it. And the woman in an interrogation afterwards was said to, her, said to the police officers, I saw you getting out of your vehicles and so what I did was I picked the shotgun up and I was bringing it around the corner and I was going to put it under, the, throw it underneath the sofa because I didn't want anybody in the kitchen to see you coming and try to load it and use it. And so then what troubled this young man and inspired him to come to find the answers to that was why did it all slow down for me? You see, he'd lived his life as a cop on the streets, moving intuitively through life situations, N knowing whether to chase a suspect down an alley, or knowing whether to go through the door in a room, or knowing whether to call backup or do other things. Technologically speaking, he had certain procedures and protocols he was supposed to follow, but every cop out there moves intuitively, intuitively through the street. They have to. They absolutely have to. When they combine the two, then they're most effective. But in this particular case, they did combine the two. But something happened, and he had to know the answer. Why did I not pull the trigger, which is exactly what I had been trained to do? Why? And where was this voice? And what was the voice? Where did it come from? Well, it comes from that Akashic record, that collective unconscious, that nirvana, that mind of God, the global mind, the matrix field, whatever it is you want to call it, or in the lexicon of a remote viewer, simply the unconscious mind. Okay? That's where it comes from. So the idea then is to be able to develop a protocol and a technique, a structure, a discipline, or something that allows you to access that. Right? That's the idea. So who else uses it? So lots of cops use it. Lots of engineers use it. I had a, a, a physicist who worked with me by the name of Kurt. And Kurt was this guy who always had this kind of an understanding that there was something to metal that was at a molecular structure, at a molecular level, something quite different from anything else he'd experienced in his life. And he was a, he was a machine gun barrel designer for Bofors Labs in Karlskoga, Sweden, which is the house of the company that was originally formed by Alfred Nobel. And so he works there doing this, and he always used to talk about this awareness of metal. So he used to say things like, this metal performed really well today, this one behaved well, and this one behaved badly, and this one was really, really stupid today and didn't do what I asked it to do. And you can imagine what happened in that case, right? All of the other physicists that were on his team were all like, whenever Kurt was talking, right? Trying to distance themselves from it. But he had this awareness, he had a belief. And so what he did was he engaged in some protocol that allowed him to no longer have the belief but empowered him with a knowledge of exactly what it was. He had been taught from the textbooks, and he knew what he was supposed to know from the textbooks. You see, that just allows him to take that technology and apply it to what he's doing. But he still doesn't understand why one behaves well and one doesn't behave well. So what he did was made this exploration inward and outward so he could come to this place of understanding that said, now he spoke of metal as the spirit of metal, as the consciousness of metal, as an awareness of metal. Now, you might be chuckling inside yourself, but old Kurt's chuckling all the way to the bank because Kurt came up with this whole uh, notion, this whole idea that if it has an awareness, if it has a consciousness to it, then it must have an unconscious aspect to it. So what he did then is he devised these two opposing RAM systems, which they patented the valve systems and everything else for them, and they hit metal so hard that they knock it unconscious. And when you knock metal unconscious, do you know what it becomes? It becomes liquid. And it's liquid in a liquid state because it forgets at a molecular level, you see, what it's supposed to be. And then it goes liquid. And it's liquid for about three microseconds. And then it shakes its head and it remembers what it's supposed to be. And then it rejoins itself together, together again. But this time, it rejoins itself together in a different way. It becomes, in Kurt's words, something other than what it was before. 
So it aligns the molecules now so that it becomes tempered steel. Now, don't get wrapped around the axle of asking the question of what's the morality of don't you feel bad about hitting metal so hard you knock it unconscious? So I've asked Kurt that question, or other people have asked him, and Kurt will say, I have asked the metal, and the metal says it is okay. <laughs> the metal says it is on purpose. It is fulfilling its, what it is supposed to fulfill. It is becoming what it is supposed to become. But think about that for a minute. You smack the metal so hard it becomes liquid because it forgets what it's supposed to be and it doesn't hold itself together in its agreement at a molecular level. It reestablishes itself, but it says, hit me again and I will not get knocked unconscious. So it establishes itself, realigning its molecules, it now becomes tempered steel. Now, explain that away by saying, well, you know, it's just a physical property of the metal. Not to old Kurt. To old Kurt, that is an absolute evidence of a consciousness a spirit, of an understanding at something at the molecular level that holds it together. Now, his company is called Morphic.se, and because of what he is capable of doing now, when you're looking into the new hydrogen-based fuel industries and you're talking about putting plates into fuel cells that extract with a low voltage charge and them extract hydrogen, which is highly explosive out of pure water, Right now, the big limitation to that is developing the fuel cells. Why? Because the plates going into the water have to be micro-machined in different directions, which is an expensive process and a very elaborate process. Think now if you have the wisdom through this journey outward and inward to knock metal unconscious and in a liquid state pour it, have it drop into a core and cavity mold system and slap a micro-machined plate out once per second, what you're going to be capable of doing in that respect. And that came from this idea of not just operating on what you believe, because everybody else in the company believed he was a lunatic, right? But he knew that there was something else beyond what they believed, and he followed his heart. He did not trust the opinion and the interpretation of others. <laughs> matrix fields, realities. Now, forget the matrix field thing. Let's just talk about things in terms of conscious and unconsciousness, right? Conscious or unconscious. You have this thing that's constantly ongoing. We exist down on the bottom line. I just put it down there just so we know our place, really, okay? Down on the bottom line, existing within the conscious, physical, three-dimensional world. And occasionally we have these minor perturbations. You see the up the red arrow there? I don't have a pointer up here, but up at the red arrow there, we have these points of awareness. Now, what do we call those outside the physical? We had, uh, Laura was up here trying, you know, working with you to get you to this particular place. We call those intuitive experiences, right? Precognitive experiences, gut instincts that uh, tie us into something that is not definable by the physical. There is no deductive reason for us getting to that particular place of awareness, but yet it is still there. You can take intuition and define it as knowing something without knowing how you really know it. Most of the women in this room have that ability which makes our life very miserable on occasion, right? They know things without knowing even how they know it and they'll ask you things and you're like, how do you know that? And they just do, right? Now all of the men in this room have the same ability. It's just through your conditioning you have stopped listening. You have stopped becoming aware of it through your conditioning. Now some of you not. But the great minds of our time, again, have been individuals who listened to this still small voice inside, who looked adductively to things and evidences and places through the event horizon without any real deductive information as to why they should look that direction. So the idea then is to get to this particular place right here, where you are spending equal elements of time in both of those places. Now, listen to me. There are all kinds of practices and paths and other things of understanding and teaching that will get you ultimately to this place. Some will take far greater amounts of time than others. The idea is to find a path, any path, be on that path, devote and dedicate yourself to that particular path and get yourself to a place where you are walking intuitively, instinctively, open and aware between both worlds. There's a shaman that we work with in Peru where we take classes down there to do some of our advanced work. He is said, Jorge, to walk in both worlds. Now, if you are walking in both worlds and you are assigning a traditional spiritual value to that, you are said to do what? Be an enlightened human being. 
walking in both worlds. I said to you early on in this that I make no pretense of being an enlightened human being. But if you can find something that you can engage yourself in that can open conduits into the unconscious for you where you walk in both worlds, then you will become better at everything that it is that you choose to do in your life for one plain, well, mo for many reasons, but certainly one very poignant and promising reason is that you will recognize and you will know that there is something beyond the physical. Do you understand how powerful that would be to know that there is something beyond the physical and not simply to believe it or to wish it or to want it, but to know it. Now there are practices you can engage in that will allow you to be in that place. So when you're there and you're able to walk in both worlds as an entrepreneur or a business person, knowing that there is something beyond the physical, what is it that you're supposed to reap from all of this? Right? There in the unconscious, there is this thing that exists in waveform. Now you've heard me say four-dimensional waveform data. The four-dimensional waveform data is simply the existence of all things, because all things outside their material physical properties exist in waveform. They all exist in waveform. Everything is energy, and energy is, everyth is everything, so therefore everything can be expressed in waveform on some level, absolutely and completely. It goes back to that whole notion of the quanta talked about by Deepak Chopra. It, it, it exists in a waveform state. Now, don't try to get too definitive in what you mean by waveform state but it is there in waveform, always. Now you can take a waveform and take wave and divide it up into two pieces here, and I only want to hit this very briefly, only because I want you to understand that it can be in this way. If you're looking at waves and you're talking about the number of waves in any given interval of time, you're talking about the frequency. So I put down here information and media, okay? So the frequency with which different messages are delivered to you for, through various sources of media uh, can be very repetitive and can be very definite in what's there. You need to keep exposing yourself to things that inspire and motivate, that teach, that give you the tools that you need to become better than you were before you read them. The things that do not inspire, the things that limit possibility and promise, the things that crush you down are the things that you need to remove from what it is that you're experiencing in the physical three-dimensional world. Back to the example of CNN, turn it off. If you want to watch the world, as Hemingway said, then so watch the world. But when you feel that you are having a negative impact, it's having a negative impact on you, then turn it off. Go look at good paintings. Be in love with someone or something and experience that. Go for a walk. Go for a run. Do something that inspires and motivates, not something that in its frequency of what it's doing and being presented to you limits your possibility and promise. The amplitude is the strength of the wave. So again, into the frequency of the human condition, there are many things that have great strength and great power that are put there into them. Back to that example in the media again, there is flashing text and graphics and dramatic music and all kinds of talking heads that come on from different directions and perspectives, all of which meet exactly the same perspective all the time, ultimately. So you can understand that of waveform. What I'm showing you here, I think you have to hit it one more time, and one more time, there you go. Is that your life in the physical world, your life in this moment is made up of many different events. And those many different events establish in that following that yellow line out forward into the future, a pattern of potentialities. Think of them as sticky points in time, if you will. So as you look back at your life, recognizing that your life is unfolding in this series as it has, and there have been a number of events, and all of these events carry with them emotions and beliefs, and those emotions and beliefs establish identities, and those identities establish or manifest behavior in this life, they move out into this realm of this pattern of potentialities. Now the biggest problem that most of us have is the fact that we keep looking backwards. We keep looking backwards because we have this attachment to the life that we have lived, and when we keep looking backwards to the life that we have lived and this established pattern of potentiality moves out into the future, we keep detaching from the moment. And the moment is the place where the choice makes a difference in how we live our life situation and makes a difference in what is possible for us. So if you keep looking backwards, Defining what is possible for you in love, defining what is possible for you in relationships, defining what is possible for you in business, defining what is possible for you in your life situation completely and wholly, you're going to miss your life altogether because you just keep looking backwards. 
so there are new series, right? And what's really important for this, for you to know this, is exactly what is possible in the future for you. Everything is possible, isn't it? On the other side of the moment, right now, anything is possible for you. And the very thing inside of you that keeps making you say, no, it's not. That's just your conditioning again. It's just what somebody else told you. It didn't come from any great wise epiphany of anything. Somebody doesn't have proof of that for you. The only proof they can offer for you is to say, well, look at everything you've ever been. What the hell makes you think there's anything is possible for you on the other side of the, of the moment? And your willingness to accept that is exactly what will create for you in the moment the filters that will, that will never allow what is possible for you on the other side of the moment to be there for you. So back to Deepak again, you can manifest from the realm of the unmanifested, which is on the right-hand side of this, you can manifest from the realm of the unmanifested virtually anything for yourself. Now, there are all sorts of practices that involve that. But back to this equation again, anything is possible for you on the other side of the moment. Okay? I'm going to jump through these. We all have different patterns. This is our life. So if you want, then, to see what's on the other side of tomorrow for you, then where are you going to get that? Well, there's one way of doing it. You can look backwards. If you keep looking backwards, you can say, OK, well, here's my pattern. Here's my habit. Here's my life. Here's what I have become. Here's my identity. And if you'll accept that, then you are capturing a pattern of potentialities that will mean that the future is exactly what this is. You get that? If you don't want the future to be exactly what that is over there, then where do you focus? Here or here? Here in the moment. It's the only thing you're in charge of. Oh, yeah, you can look over here. And Uncle Dave standing up here is telling you one thing right now. Everything is possible for you on the other side of the moment. It's a mathematical fact that anything is possible. As we go further away from the moment, the probabilities increase. As we come closer to the moment, which is what those boxes are up there, as we come closer to the moment, the probabilities decrease. Right? But anything is possible for you on the other side of the moment. And you really have to get that, or you're just going to live a life of limits and possibilities that are originating from the past, because that's what creates your manifest behavior and your identity. So if you're willing to surrender that and embrace that, then you can be in the moment and understand that anything is possible for you on the other side. And when you understand that anything is possible for you on the other side, then in the moment, as you make these choices, which is the mechanism of the moment, it is the thing that drives the moment, then there is one thing that you must be capable of doing, and that is to go to that place of peace, to go to that place of quiet, to go to that place of inner silence, and then carry with you a question. And when you're looking at what's there in that space, what's available in that space that's out there? Everything. It's in that the space, the gap in this matrix field. Everything is there. It's a holographic matrix field. You see, it's not limited to what somebody else pulled from there and stuck in a book and threw it down there. It's not limited by what somebody who stands up on a stage in front of you and tells you it is that's out there. It's not limited to that. When you stand in the unconscious, you stand in the matrix field of all things, in the Akashic record, in the global mind. And if you can get there and carry a question in, being specific and focused and carry the question in, you can come out with an answer. Now, when you talk about thought incubation and you're using it in the different places that we're using it, in the different corporations that we're using it, statistically speaking, if you go into this place inside yourself, in this altered state, and carry a question in, you will produce 10 times more, 10 times more usable information, solutions to problems, than you ever will by just simply following a brainstorming technique. You get a bunch of people around the table in a brainstorming session, and what always happens? You know? Go back to David Hughes and Sony, an executive vice president. He has seven patents for Sony and 14 patents pending for Sony, this one man. And that's why he's so interested in this, right? He's so interested in this going into this unconscious state and being able to explore in the matrix field about possibility. Why? Because he gets it all day long with his staff, walking up and down the hall. Hey, Dave, I got a really good idea. OK, good. Yeah. Standing at the urinal. Guy on this side, guy on that side. I got a really good idea for the meeting this Friday, Dave. That's good. Bring it on in. Then they all get into the meeting, and they go up with a facilitator up to the front board. And all these guys, these little introverted characters that come up with these really great ideas to stop 
music theft, piracy, and none of them throw one out. On occasion, one or two of them throw an idea out, but then the big extroverts in the room all smash it down, kafum. Why? Because they want to get their name on the patent, on their patent, right? So all these young guys and older guys just step back. So statistically speaking, if you're looking at any given population, it's about 75% introverted and 25% extroverted. So what that means then is that when you're looking at the corporate population, you sit into a room and you start brainstorming something, you get 25% of the people harvested ideas. The other 75% sit back in the room and go, okay. And then the other piece of that is you ask the 75% to honor, to support, and to make happen the ideas of the 25%. And how far do you think that gets you to go? It's a whole big thing just came out in Harvard Business Review, right? They're looking at this whole thing. Well, when, we get our, when we're done trying to get rid of the bottom 5 or 10% of our population, we spend all of our time then trying to reinforce the top 10% of our population. And what this, they finally come to this conclusion saying, well, it's the other percentage in the middle that really drives our company and keeps it going and makes it happen and makes it be what it can be. It's not the top 10% or the bottom 10%. We really need to figure out a way to harvest from this middle piece that's here, this middle percentage. So one of the things that happens in thought incubation when you're applying that technique is you're simply taking people into a room and you establish the question as a manager and you say, this is what I want to explore. Be specific. Generalities will only generate general ideas. But be specific. And I don't care if all you do in that situation is put on some soft meditative music and give them 60 minutes to close their eyes and just think of ideas. And when they generate those ideas, they write them down on a piece of paper, objectifying four-dimensional waveform data, coherent three-dimensional thought form, now written down and objectified, and then collect that. And when you collect it and you look at it, now you're going to have ideas that never would have been harvested through the standard brainstorming technique. Now, that's a very simple application. You can go to much more complex applications, which is what we do, which is where we bring people in and drive them to a theta wave state and harvest the data systematically from them. You, in doing what you do as entrepreneurs and as business people and as mothers and fathers and students and financiers and everything else that you're doing, if you will just learn this, just know that inside yourself, in this matrix field, in the quiet of your mind, if you will go there and if you will explore these things, you can follow in the footsteps of all the greatest minds of our time. People like Ely Calloway of Calloway Golf, who learned this at the age of 92 in these classes. And he learned it because he knew that his design for the Big Bertha Calloway Golf Club did not come from engineering school, right? You could be Buck Charlson, the founder of Life Sciences Foundation, who designed the orbital engine which powers most of the world's open water freighters, who's the guy who designed the hydraulic system and has the patents on them, most of the ones that are in the undercarriages of the commercial airliners we all fly in today. And he did them at age 21, and he did it at age 32. And he took this training at the age of 93. Why? He wanted to know where it came from because he knew that the design concepts that came to him once as he was rising out of sleep and the other time as he stood there in Minneapolis, St. Paul, sat there in his study with a cup of tea staring out the window into the snow. And one moment the tea was steaming and then he became lost in thought coming inside of himself. And then when he came back into consciousness again, he took a sip of tea and it was cold. He wanted to know where he went. He wanted to know what he was seeing and why he came up with these ideas that made millions upon millions of dollars for him. Ely, or Reeves Calloway, who designs Calloway race cars and Calloway Corvettes, he wants to know why it is he's able to win on the track because of the ideas and the design concepts and the composites of metals and other things that go into the frames of his race cars, why and where that came from for him. This is what I want you to know. If you got nothing from this, get this. At the unconscious level in this matrix field where everything exists in waveform, there is no limit. You see, it's no limit to knowledge. It doesn't mean that it has to come from the book or from the training or anything else. It's there. It exists in this. It's the place where those who have led this human population 
to great places where we stand right now. Despite all of the things that plague the human condition, there is great promise and possibility. There is great technology. There is great love and there is great compassion. Those individuals that have brought us to this place have not done so deductively. They have done so by looking at something inward, even not even recognizing often where it came from, but knowing that it was real and trusting that it was real. Outside the opinion and the interpretation of those who said to them, if you didn't learn it on page 26, it does not exist, okay? And if you will know that, then you can assign this term to yourself. The unconscious level, you are omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, you are eternal. Energy cannot die, it cannot die. And so there, beyond this garage, beyond this skin, when all others tell you, beware, because outside this skin lie dragons, yeah, there are no such things. Do this, learn this by some technique or process. Don't allow others to define your reality for you. You are infinite. You have a tremendous, great, infinite wealth of wisdom inside of you. Follow your heart. Follow your conscience and become all the great things that you can be. Thank you.